Okay, just give me a sec. Okay, oh, oh, good, great, great. Then. Okay, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Raymond. I'm uh, from uh, Datakind, uh, and I'll be doing basically a talk on uh, some of our work within Datakind. Uh, uh, with uh, in conjunction with Wei Yang, who is another volunteer with us. Okay, uh, so just a quick thing. Um, so this is not our day job. We are actually purely volunteers. Uh, and uh, I'm actually from Lazada, and Wei Yang is from NUS. Uh, and we do this completely um, outside of our regular work, and we are not speaking on behalf of uh, either of our two organizations. Okay, so uh, so today my talk is going to be on using uh, pro bono data science to make the world slightly better. Uh, and I'll basically start with a quick uh, introduction to what we are planning to talk about today. So um, I'll start with a bit, with a quick introduction of what data kind is all about. Uh, we'll then talk a little bit about data protection as well as information ethics and as well as responsibility. Uh, sorry, reproducibility. Uh, we'll be covering either two or three case studies. The first one is Ojoy, uh, giving SG if we have enough time. As well as the last one, which is, will be done by Wei Yang, will be the Raffles Bandit Langer Working Group. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, what Datakind is about. So basically, Datakind is all about harnessing the power of science, data science in the service of humanity. So, in a nutshell, what we do is that we are a bunch of data scientists who just volunteer our time to help. Uh, non-profit organizations with any of their data problems, uh, be it things like you know data collection, be it things like uh, data analysis, and what we try to do is basically uh, make sure that we can uh, get use our uh, all the data that they have available to increase their social impact. Um, it, it will become clearer once we actually kind of go through the actual case studies. Okay, so, oops. Uh, ooh, that's a bit fine. Okay, so. Uh, so Datakind basically is not just a purely Singapore organization. In fact, we are just a branch of the organization. Our organization is headquartered in New York City. Uh, it's been there for about seven plus years. Uh, then we basically have uh, two other, actually one now, one other location in the UK. Uh, and as well as uh, in Asia, we have basically Bangalore as well as Singapore uh, branches. Uh, in, the US itself, we have basically San Francisco Bay Area as well as Washington, uh, which also does uh, work there. Uh, in general, everyone outside of New York basically is a volunteer, including the chapter leads, uh, one, I'm one of them. We basically just uh, provide our services for free. Uh, the main HQ actually does some uh, work on a more professional basis. They actually have full-time data science scientists working on specific projects, usually related to things like, you know, they, they had projects like Vision uh, Zero, which is all about reducing uh, traffic accidents uh, within the US. Um, but in general, outside of uh, the US, we basically do jobs uh, more or less for free. Okay. So uh, the way we work is basically through uh, our project funnel. Uh, we have a meetup group where we organize all our volunteers. Uh, generally, people within the central committee or the main committee does outreach. Looking in this case, basically, we look for nonprofits to help with data needs, whether they are mature enough that we can actually help them, and how we can uh, basically assess impact once we help them. We then go on to something called a project accelerator, where we basically have the community come in and discuss how we can uh, use data. Uh, in conjunction with the, the needs of the organization and basically come up with useful projects or useful types of analysis that we can do. Uh, then we go to this thing called the monthly data dive, uh, sorry, the data jams, which is all about cleaning up data, getting things ready, because you know, basically that's the vast majority of data science is basically all this weird plumbing that has to be done. We do this on a monthly basis for about two or three hours a week, where we basically you know, clean up the data, anonymize the data, and do um, all the weird things that needs to be done in order to get the data ready for analysis. Then, after that, we have this two and a half day intensive um, data dive where it's like a, like a hackathon, but without, this comp without the competitive uh, aspects of it. We basically come together as a community with the prepared data set and try to, as quickly as possible, get as much insights from the data as possible. Then we basically get back this insights uh, and send it back to the nonprofits, and hopefully they can make use of that data as part of their day-to-day -day operations and to improve social impact. Uh, finally, we have data corps, which we currently only have done one. Uh, this is basically a longer process. So in our case, we did a data corp, uh, which Wei Yang will actually be talking about. This data corp essentially uh, was over a three-month period where we actually dived in very intensely with a small group of volunteers for like five hours per week to actually analyze the data and. 
uh, come up with a, a very in-depth solutions. And he will basically be talking about that uh, very in-depth thing that we did. Okay, so uh, I want to briefly kind of go in a, on a site surgeon to basically talk a little bit about what, how we actually uh, do some of our data analysis because uh, as you know, um, privacy and issues like that are actually very, very sensitive. So generally when we do um, our data analysis, we take things like data protection and informatic, uh, information ethics very, very seriously. So this is basically our standard slide when we actually do any of our data work. We usually display this so that every one of our volunteers is aware of all the issues that, uh, that, can, uh, that can arise when we handle data. For the most important thing is things like data protection, things like privacy, we take very seriously. Collection of data, we take very seriously. And security, we don't want the data to leak. Uh, in terms of informa information ethics, it's all about basically making sure that the data is used for the purpose as expressed by the nonprofit. So, for example, if you're doing something like you know volunteer management for a nonprofit organization, you don't want to turn around and use that data set of email addresses that they pot could potentially have and do it for your own internet marketing of some kind. That's completely forbidden. So, we basically want everyone to be very responsible about the use of data. The other thing we can get very anal about, uh, which Paul actually covered uh, in yesterday's workshop, is reproducibility. So the idea is basically this. Uh, we want our, me our methods for data cleaning to be more or less program programmatically done, so it can be easily reproduced. We can do things like we can push it to Git repos and basically repeat the analysis again and again and again. This is especially useful uh, from an operational point of view when the organization comes to us with a data set. We do analysis on a data set, they get more information coming in, and they can more or less, with some help, do the analysis again on more incoming data. We want that to happen rather than us having to keep doing analysis again and again and again and again and again. So for us, reproducibility is a very important thing and we try to have like, uh, tools set aside to do reproducibility. So basically, in terms uh, of all our efforts, the main thing we try to avoid is negative impacts to society. For example, what happens to the in, uh, what happened to all the Facebook products? Uh, sorry, P Facebook profiles uh, for Cambridge, uh, which Cambridge Analytics used during their so-called data breach. So in this case, basically, it violates a lot of things that we we talk about. A lot of the analysis is not reproducible. Cambridge Analytics basically hides all of this behind and does really weird, unethical things with all the data profiles they collect. Um, Facebook also doesn't t tell you anything about all the algorithms that they do. Uh, so essentially, we as a non-profit organization and volunteer base. We want to avoid all of this. We want to be completely accountable. So essentially, the aspiration is this. We want all our analysis to be auditable. So you have a step-by-step -step, um, trace of how you actually carried out the analysis, all the transformations, all the data cleaning that is done, all the kinds of models that you apply. Uh, we want the, tr the conclusions to be transparent so that you, know, you don't come out and do some strange analysis that does not you know, fit the, um, the impact of the organization. We need to protect privacy. So very often when we actually do uh, our data analysis, we actually go through a round of data uh, of anonymization with the organization to make sure that you know, none of their personal data is leaked. Um, and finally, we, uh, finally, the final two things are basically data isolation from model and independent, uh, independent testing. So the idea behind this is that we can actually take the model and be sure that very clearly what is going on in the model. We can also test the model for things like biases and all these kind of uh, issues related to um, the uh, model not do, uh, having unintended consequences, uh, and also test the data for biases if we have to, or if the data is too private, we can basically leave the data one side and just make sure that our models are clean. So you can basically test these two components independently to make sure everything is uh, all right and okay. And of course, uh, if anyone actually has a more uh, more powerful tools in order to address privacy with, within uh, data analytics, please let me know also. But we generally do this and uh, we just separate our, our two processes so that we can actually just deal with them separately. So uh, I will basically go through a quick uh, example uh, of the kind of projects we do. So this is uh, Ojoy. So what Ojoy does is uh, they're actually a community health uh, intervention unit, institute, which basically takes patients from the community and provides counseling for mental, self, uh, for, for mental health. So uh, as you can tell, basically, the kind of data which comes in is going to be fairly private. You're talking about the mental health uh, issues surrounding patients. Uh, so what we did for them is, firstly, we had to, uh, we got the data pre-anonymized. Uh, so 
but uh, because like you know many people are, many organizations are not super data savvy we actually went through all the data again to make sure that there was no PDPA which means uh, personally identifiable information in the in any of the fields that were provided we, we did this basically uh, programmatically to make sure that you know names were not there IC numbers were not there then we removed the fields that were actually um, had this information, additional fields. So you think, think, for example, in this case, we had things like remark fields, which potentially contain some uh, dubiously, do, some, do, not so much dubious, but personal information. We removed things like that to make sure that none of the information got out. And then we basically opened this up to the community rather, uh, under rel fairly lenient NDA so that it could analyze the data. So this is kind of our personal, uh, our anonymization slash uh, personal privacy pipelines that we use. So uh, the end result is basically using that data, we could create a dashboard uh, to basically facilitate um, uh, the running of the organization. The idea being that we could do things like reduce the number of poor referrals uh, and with the final goal of basically improving the well-being and mental health of both the patients in the, in the institution as well as the uh, helpers and caregivers that were uh, with these people. So uh, this is basically the final result. Unfortunately, as I mentioned previously, a lot. Of, uh, this was actually done in Tableau, which is unfortunately one not one of the best tools for reproducibility because the data is stuck with the analysis. We really dislike doing that, but because of time constraints and the fact that I think we showed the we did a prototype and the nonprofit was like, "Wow, this is so wonderful," and they kind of like you know glossed over all the data protection issues. But so what happens is that we did analysis for them, uh, showing. All all the, and they just wanted to look at this and not do anything reproducible. But nonetheless, you can get quite a bit of insight. So for example, uh, the rapid dropouts are one of the main things that they liked a lot, uh, which was basically which of the, um, the sources of data, come, uh, sorry, the sources of referrals were actually causing issues. Uh, so for example, a rapid dropout meant that the patient didn't turn up or the patient basically turned up for a single event uh, and then basically fell out of the system because you're expected to, come, to do basically maybe about six sessions with them and if you just drop out, it means that you know, you're just not really matching the organization and you want to kind of, kind of reduce issues like that because it does take a bit of time. Okay, uh, I will think I'm probably going to skip over the next section and pass it over to Wei Yang who will... Oh, uh, and a quick thing just before we leave. Uh, these are the people who were basically involved uh, in that particular project. Ooh, what happened? Okay, uh, so... Uh, Kevin and Jeremy, who is here, they helped a lot basically organizing this entire, uh, the data sets and stuff. Uh, yeah, and then Paul is around basically doing all his uh, Docker stuff and making sure, trying to get things reproducible. In this case, the, the, basically the sponsor who is the non-profit guy, this is uh, Jim, Jim Cat. he basically uh, was very, very keen on, uh, on just uh, getting the, the dashboards out. Okay, so I'm going to skip over my next one and pass it over to Wei Yang. Okay, so um, <coughs> so <coughs> I'm going to talk about the Raffles Bender Langer project that uh, Datakind did with uh, the uh, what we call Raffles Bender Langer Working Group (RBL WG). So this is a Langer. Uh, so m you may not be very familiar. With this. this is not one of the most common species that you see in Singapore. The uh, the, the the very common ones we we you know, we don't really care about them too much. Uh, <coughs> but this particular uh, subspecies of monkey called the uh, Raffles Bender Langer, uh, they are estimated to be around 40 to 50, 40 to 60 left in Singapore, critically endangered uh, here. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, Raffles Bender Langer. Um, so, in order to uh, tackle the conservation issues with this uh, Langer, uh, the RBLWG was set up uh, to try to understand the biology of the langurs and then also to tackle the protection of the habitat. So what, what happened was that uh, RBLWG contacted Datakind in order to understand a uh, few things about what they can do with their data. So the first thing is that uh, how can data and technology be used to de derive insights and tools for conservation. So the kind of data that they provided with to us was uh, for example sighting times, uh, locations, activities, so what, what these monkeys did 
and then also uh, like three species that they were sided with. So uh, they they were trying to understand uh, to to want to they want to have tools or or either other kind of analysis in order to understand how the langurs behave or how are there perhaps any uh, relationship between the monkeys and the any particular tree species that they like and location that they are in. So uh, the other question that they wanted to answer was uh, using how can langur photos be used to estimate langur population using machine vision. So that was a kind of a, a harder much much harder problem that that was being faced uh, at that uh, and it's probably one of the harder issues that uh, data kind SG did which is why we um, we decided that it, we would escalate it to to be a data corp which is uh, so we have an intensive two to three months period uh, yeah because of the short time frame so we just had two to three month period and then we had a uh, intensive session where the volunteers came down for about five hours per week to to tackle this problem. So what we had was essentially 1,000 plus photos taken by volunteers, and so these photos uh, we had to try to understand whether we can use it to to uh, extract any useful information. So um, <clears throat> so in order to estimate uh, individual uh, like the Langer population using photos, what happened was that you you have to have identify individual langurs out of this 1000 plus photos right so that will be a very difficult problem to to tackle so i'll talk about um this is few issues separately so um so the way we approach this was to first use uh, design a geo visualization dashboard so using a dashboard of course then we can identify uh how you know it's just a simple tool where we can derive some insights and statistics where the uh, RBLWG can then use to uh, understand more about Langer's. And then we also uh, develop a, a Langer zoning uh, method uh, that, that we use to try to estimate the Langer areas and where they are moving around. And then in terms of photos, uh, how we decided to go ahead was eventually get do, a, do up a web app, which we affectionately call Tinder for monkeys. Uh, so this web app, uh, we are trying essentially uh, trying to use it to crowdsource the labeling for monkey photos. Um, so th this is the dashboard that we uh, built for our BLWG. So there are, we have a map here, and then the map uh, with various Langer locations, and then they are colored by the various activities that they, they are doing uh, in these different areas. So some of them maybe they're feeding, mating, or defecating in certain areas, or or like uh, certain tree species, uh, perhaps. Um, so <coughs> so this simple feature, using these few simple features, we can already kind of identify whether you know what are their favorite locations and what they are they doing there. Uh, so the tool that we use was Power BI. Uh, so because of the constraints uh, by the organization, all the tools has to be free. So Power BI is one of the the tools that allow us to do that quite e uh, effectively under free uh, using a free software. Uh, of course, the locations are all anonymized here. Um, <coughs> so, what kind of insights can we draw from this? So things like uh, for uh, crossing roads. So some of the langurs they are in areas where uh, there are the roads passing through the forest. And so there can be road kills uh, sometimes. So the organization really wanted to prevent such issues. And so because of that, uh, once we visualize this, like for example, if you see that there are any langurs crossing road, of course this is not a real location. They are not in Lim Chu Kang. Uh, but uh, essentially, uh, you know, when, we, when, when they see that uh, the langurs are all frequently spotted around areas where there are roads and very fast cars moving, uh, then you can start to think about how we can tackle the issue of uh, road kills. There are only about 50, 40 to 60 left in Singapore, so this is very, very essential to inform policy um, policy design. Um, then, um, so in the future, we intend to add more data, data points, more uh, kinds of uh, information into the dashboard, like uh, the tree types and other behaviors. Um, then the next thing that we did was to estimate the Langer zones. So based on the data point that we collected, we want to estimate 
what are the hot spots and essentially the areas, the zone that we really want to conserve. Um, so based on the hotspot, we use the R to do a kernel density estimation. Uh, so using the KDA method, we estimated the probability of the Langer's roaming around uh, this area. So the yellow patches that you see here are the high probability of uh, observing Langer's and then uh, you have the blue ones which is a uh, lower probability of observing Langer's. Um, <coughs> and so some of the insight that we can get out of this is that uh, we see, we realize that there are uh, different hotspots. Uh, so we have actually different groups of Langer's, not just one group of Langer that's uh, roaming around the forest patches. Uh, so, and then we can also further break down the zones into different activities. So like, uh, for example, they like to feed in certain areas or uh, when they're traveling, that, then you actually see that uh, you, you, you site them in various other locations. So maybe they are doing one acti activity in one place, but they they need to travel to uh, to do other things and then the playing areas are also different so they actually have a preference for certain areas uh, now the last problem that we face is the using creating the web app uh, which was <coughs> actually done quite intensively uh, by by our volunteers oh. um, <coughs> so we call it tinder for monkeys um, Maybe so. It's not exactly like Tinder. We are not matchmaking people with monkeys, but trying to identify uh, whether we can match make it, match make two different photos. So if two two different photos are of the same monkey, then we can um, you can click on it and and decide whether you are very sure that uh, these are actually two photos of the same monkey. Um, so essentially, by doing that, then we crowdsource the labeling of uh, the photos. And then hopefully, so after uh, a round of data collection, we are able to then make use of uh, machine learning to, to, add, to, to build a model to then classify the photos of these monkeys. So this is the link here, rbl-classify.herokuapp.com. So if you're interested, you can check out this, uh, this web app that we built. Go over there and label the monkey photos right um, and then help us to do monkey classification <coughs> um, so some of the design considerations that went through was uh, whether should we include two monkey photos to collect the labels or maybe up to 10 so that the volunteers can uh, classify multiple monkeys at the same time so volunteers that help us to do this classification essentially they are also uh, tight on time is volunteer based we want to try to extract as much information as possible within a short time frame um, so to we have uh, if you recall we have about 1,000 plus photos and to classify 1,000 plus photos we that means we have half a million pairs that we actually want to match make uh, with half a million pairs then we uh, and and depending on the volunteer base and their interests uh, we want to try to optimize this process if we actually include more photos then um, it's better for data collection um, but if we have um, two photos uh, which we is, is eventually decided two photos, we realized that if you, you show 10 pictures of Langer's they start to all look the same so then that, that, that becomes not so you know good for uh, our data collection um, and then the other point was to whether we should in include a confidence scale. So on a scale of zero to ten, should we do, we, do you think that this? Uh, how confident are you that this pair is uh, actually same or different? So, <coughs> um, yeah. So uh, we de eventually decided that we won't include a confidence scale. So bias, right? Some a uh, five might mean something for you, but mean something else for a different person. So then we didn't want to uh, mess up that. Um, and then of course technical challenges include having, being, having to use all free platforms. Uh, so we use right, Power BI for our dashboard, R for the zoning problem. And for this, we uh, decided that uh, we would use uh, Heroku for hosting the web app. So Heroku actually provides uh, a free first web app and then for the database, uh, database is a 
PostgreSQL database. So we have free 10 million rows, and if we exceed that, then we just pay $7 per year, which is okay. Uh, and then we have a Vue.js web framework and Django for microservices. So uh, essentially, it's a very free or very low budget uh, way to develop a, a whole web app for, for uh, pro bono services. Um, then, of, then we have other technical challenges like a user experience because photos are heavy uh, on the communication cost. So um, then we had to you know, scale down the photo size, uh, so resize everything so that we get a better user experience. Uh, most of our volunteers are, you know, they are first time building a web app too, and they also have time constraints. We build all these things within a, a two month period. So finally, uh, this is the group that helped us to achieve everything. So thanks to uh, the very enthusiastic crowd here, uh, we have the dashboard team, and then we have uh, the group that did uh, the, the, the zoning, including uh, Jeremy and, uh, and Raymond, of course. And then we have uh, the other team here that did, uh, did up the web app within a very short time frame of two to three months. So uh, thanks to them, we are able to do all this amazing analysis. Um, so finally, these are our sponsors. And um, for any of you here who are interested in doing uh, volunteering for uh, your, your data analysis skills for uh, any pro bono or N N uh, MPOs, um, we are looking for product managers, uh, data scientists, and data engineers who are enthusiastic and able to help. So check out our website, datakind.org um, uh, slash chapter slash datakind-sg. Uh, we usually organize our activities on Meetup, so we have a, a monthly data jam and uh, one, um, about bi-yearly uh, data dive. Um, and then uh, we also have a Facebook page, so please check it out. Thank you. Did you use some kind of object with face detection? I think everyone can do that. Okay. It is for the yeah. So did you crop the pictures somehow? Because uh, all because I saw the pictures they they're pretty they only show the face of the monkey and I guess it's not all true that's not true for all the pictures. So you used face detection or something like this? Uh so the no, we we well we found uh most of our photos are taken with the monkeys as the objects, so they are already centralized. So all, all we had to do was to uh, resize them, make it smaller, and then so website where we can do a just a batch batch cropping and resizing of the photos that we found is it's free. So that that was uh, amazing for us. Um, so we just uploaded one batch of photos and then we, we resized and they, they just cropped with the monkey in the middle. So uh, that was, yeah, very so useful. So you select the monkey from the picture? Um, so the face would be in So I don't think that website actually did recognize the face, but it just sort of like cropped it to, to the middle. So the monkeys were already the, the, the main object of the, the photo, yeah. So the photos were all similar? Uh, Many of the photos they look well. Well, some of the photos I've already I displayed. They they are like like these ones or uh, or uh, this one. So yeah, they they yeah, and and they look very similar. Yeah. So you just crop like twenty percent from each side. Yeah, we just crop like s s some like yeah out of each side. Yeah. So just you mentioned that um, the people who are doing the photo taking are actually scientists. So they are, you know, they're quite anal about getting everything into the center of the image. So it's, it was specifically manually done that way. Maybe they crawled into the center. They might have done a bit of it too. Yeah. And we should mention also that this will probably, hopefully, become an AI project with machine learning. But we'll see whether we can update the labels. <laughs> Maybe. This could be hard because 2,000 pictures. I know. I know. Yes. But so more, more photos are also coming as yes. we speak. The volunteers are going out yeah. to take more photos. So, so yeah. Up, but we 
real time. How many were classified so far? Actually, don't know yet. We have to. We haven't unlocked the DBA. Yes. Uh, we haven't. Yeah, so we have to check because we've just been running that for some time, and it's hasn't yeah. crashed yet. So we have actually looked and see what's inside. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you.